So, welcome to a slightly different Wednesday special, or What I Did on My Holidays, by Drac, aged... Anyways, whilst in Budapest, I found myself walking along the Danube, on the Pest side, near the Parliament Building, and it's important to uh, know which side you're on, Buda or Pest, uh, especially when you're in Hungary, for obvious reasons. Um, and I was hoping that I'd read the sparest signs in Hungarian properly, and as it turns out, I had since next to this building is a rather new, unique ship that a lot of people don't know about. And so I present to you the SMS Leitha, or Latja, depending on what part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire you're from. Yes, I heard both of them repeated many times, and no, I'm probably not pronouncing either of them correctly. Here we are. Might as well start our tour with a good bell. The Leitha is one of the earliest surviving ironclad ships, and the second oldest example of a classic monitor, the older vessel being the Huascar in South America. Historically, security on the Austro-Hungarian waterways had been ensured by a number of small warships and gunboats, but these were vulnerable to attack at the close ranges encountered in riverine warfare, especially when the more modern guns that were coming into service were involved. But at the same time, eyes were keenly fixed on the innovations coming out of the American Civil War, and one of these was the monitor type of warship employed at the Battle of the Hampton Roads, but then also extensively in the harbours and rivers of the US. The monitor's durability, firepower, and effectiveness against forts and other ships in these confined waters were greatly attractive to the Austro-Hungarians, who had a relatively limited commitment to an ocean-going navy, but, as mentioned earlier, plenty of internal waterways to police and a number of hostile powers along a number of rivers on almost all sides. And so, they became leaders in the field as far as Europe went, ordering a pair of river monitors, the Leitha and Maros, in keeping with tradition, one of them named after an Austrian river, the Leitha, and the other named after a Hungarian river, the Maros, they would be the first of their kind in Europe. The two ships were ordered in 1869 at the urging of Admiral Tegethoff, yes, that Admiral Tegethoff, and started construction at the Wiepest and Obudai shipyards near Budapest in 1870, launching in 1871. As some aspects of the new naval technologies were highly advanced, a few parts, such as the turret, were ordered from the British, and as such, the turret followed the Coles pattern of design. The designers of the monitors had to take into account a number of factors. Primary amongst them was that many European rivers were very shallow, which in turn would demand a very shallow draft, even less than that found on many American monitors. However, the displacement of the ships would be governed primarily by the need to support the heavily armoured turret and the armour belt along the monitor's sides. So, although the ships were about as long as the original USS monitor, the beam was narrowed significantly and the keel raised so that the bottom was almost flat, since seakeeping was not going to be required of them at all. Further, the belt armour was made just under 2 inches thick and backed by 8 inches of teak, but it was incredibly shallow, thus minimising weight. To ensure enough height was left in the hull, the deck armour, just over two-thirds of an inch thick, was curved and sloped to increase its effectiveness and form turtle back protection. The funnel was also collapsible to allow the ship to fit under bridges at high tides, with two toilet cubicles mounted forward, one per side, as there was not enough space below, and two boats hung aft from davits. There's the uh, <laughs> semi-armoured toilet, if you... Uh need to relieve yourself in battle. Obviously this has been repositioned to the second refit position, whereas before it would have been up front there. And All the told, the these piece. efforts left the ship able to float in just over four feet of water, meaning the entire 310 ton warship could be floated in the average swimming pool with depth to spare. In their original configuration, the ship was armed solely with the two main guns in the single turret forward which also had a small conning tower atop it. The guns were the M1861 pattern 150mm or 6 inch cannon, although at the time the older designation of 24 pounder was also still in use. 
Designed by Warhendorf in Sweden, they were the first breech-loading rifled guns to be manufactured and enter Austro-Hungarian service. Each gun was fired using a black powder charge of just under 2.3 kilos, which could be made up of two individual bags or a single larger one. Three shell types were available, armor-piercing, shrapnel, and canister, which was supplied from an 80-round magazine one deck down through a small hatchway. And as we go up, 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 you can see there's the armoured conning tower. We're going to have a look up there a bit later on. There's a water pump, just in case you take damage. A little bit of battle damage there. And here's the entrance to the way down under. So, as they say, let's go down the hatch. The turret extended above and below the main deck and on the lower floor two manual drives were used to move it around. Due to the weight involved, after a few years in service a small steam engine was introduced to take over the turret training. It also had a lip at its junction with the armoured deck to prevent easy jamming by boarding or fragments from hits. Given its river usage, the crew were also supplied with rifles, pistols and bayonets, just in case. Right, here we are in kind of well, pretty much the centre of the ship. Apologies for the video quality, but it is very dark in here. And here you can see we're under the turret. This is the, uh, well, the kind of the barbette. We're protected by the ship's armor on either side. And here is where you can see the various charges are stored. So um, with that said, let's see if we can find where that hatch is. That hatch was at the back. Dummy shells, luckily. Yep, yeah, there, there. There is the hatch that leads up into the turret with a little fold away ladder. I can tell you at six foot nothing, um, this is my eye line. So, hope they employed short people. <laughs> or hopefully, maybe, I don't know, maybe the deck was a bit lower down. Because um, otherwise, you're going to get your head clonked an awful lot. But yeah, there you go. So, there's the two ammunition racks. We're in the main munitions chamber, and let's proceed further down into the ship. The crew themselves, originally around 40, but eventually up to 57 in later years, had limited quarters in the front section of the ship, where the ceiling was rather low. The ship was divided into seven watertight compartments, which meant that getting through the ship, below decks, was an exercise in fitting through numerous small armoured hatchways, between these and the low-slung beams, it's just as well they give you helmets for this particular part, or I'd have knocked myself out cold several times. There's a little storeroom just in the front, in the bow there. And then if we pan over here, here is the crew quarters, also in the bow. There we go. Just while they give you helmets, this place is a really good way to lose a few brain cells. Victory. There we go. Well, that's a hammock for you. And there's somebody. Uh, yeah, look at all the food he's not having. It's an obligatory picture of the emperor. So, this is down the hatch in the front. So, we're going to now go into the area around the turret barbette with any luck. Yeah, well, at least they've proved the vampires down here in the uh, food storage room. Plenty of sausage and bread and all that lovely stuff. I wonder what could be in there. No prizes for guessing. Right, so in our new vampire proof monitor, ooh, I'm guessing this is someone who might have been in charge. They get a bunk bed. Look at that kind of luxury. There's the area we're defending around here at the moment. I wonder if it'll pick up into the darkness we go. Each of these doors are also form watertight bulkheads which divide the ship up into multiple compartments. There's some kind of audio visual going on in the other room so uh, I won't video into there but this is an important development. You can see the other one over there. This is an important development in ship technology as it means that you can divide, you can take flooding in one or more sections without the ship going under. Right well coming up out of the back <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times that hat has saved my skull. That place is a very, very cramped little area. <laughs> um, so, yeah.
In this configuration, the ship would first see action in 1876 against fortresses protecting Belgrade, which was then under Ottoman control, before sailing south as part of a campaign in 1878 to take Bosnia, again from the Ottoman Empire, fighting up and down the Sava River. The next year, a single quad-barrel Nordenfelt gun was installed to provide some close-in protection against small boats and parties of men on shore. The next major refit would take place in 1887, when a flying bridge was added, more superstructure was built out up around and near the funnels, and a second quad-barrel Nordenfelt gun was added, with the two guns now being placed on each wing at the same level as the flying bridge. Well, here's the steering position and the cupola on top of the turret. <laughs> you might be able to see from here that, um, well, a little bit of an obstructed view and also Unlike, say, a battleship, where the range is quite long, obviously as a river monitor, the ship would have been fighting at very close quarters. And so, whilst you might be steering from here in uh, times of peace, you can just possibly, depending on the light, you might be able to just about see the backup steering wheel in there. And I think this would have been one of the instances where commanders very definitely would have popped into uh, the oldie Capola here because uh, at this kind of close range you are very definitely going to be the target even of small arms fire so um, I, yeah I would definitely use this <laughs> in uh, if you're in combat. And there's the uh, intake for the engine. I wonder how far down the, the rabbit hole goes. Um, apparently fair distance. Yeah down there. And here's one of the other refit items. A uh, well semi kind of not quite quad machine gun but Near enough quad rapid firing Norden belts. Great part about it is you can still just about move these around if you happen to really dislike people on the uh, far side. I wonder if this bit moves. Yep, a little bit. Not too much though. And there's the fire. Alright, and here's the other one looking out across the Danube. And uh, again, trainable. Now, the reason I say it's kind of machine gun, but not quite, you'd have your ammunition in here, um, unlike the uh, British Navy version that this was adapted from, which had 40 rounds per gun. This one, for some reason that they still don't quite understand, had 32 rounds, all gravity fed in this hopper, as we said. And to fire it, so it's not quite a machine gun, but you have this the wonderful lever pull the lever like so and that fires all of the four, all four barrels at once and then you have to there we go push that back into position that loads another lot and then you fire again and again and again so yeah semi-automatic firing of uh, four barrels quite nice little uh, weapon really for the time. Um, good against small river craft and troops that might be shooting at you and they very much would be. Uh, there's your bridge. This gives you an idea just how small the ship is because there's the bow, there's the turret, there's the cupola, there's the uh, wheel, there's your ventilation. Here we are with the uh, defensive armament, the two Nordenfelts, funnel and stern. It really is not the world's largest vessel. The 1890s saw another, much more extensive, series of refits, with the main turret completely replaced by one that carried a single quick-firing 120mm 35 caliber Krupp field gun, and the Nordenfelts were first supplemented by a Skoda machine gun and then replaced entirely by a pair of 47mm Hotchkiss cannon, with the machine gun being capped. During this period, the engines were also replaced. The original engines were good only for a top speed of around 8 knots, which meant that in some faster flowing parts of certain rivers in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the ship actually needed a tow as it couldn't get upstream against the current on its own. This was because the engines were ex-locomotive boilers, since this type was lighter than marine engines, and weight, as mentioned before, had been an overriding consideration during its initial construction. Additional superstructure and vents were also installed to accommodate the newer and more powerful engines, and these would allow the ship to go anywhere within the Austro-Hungarian waterway system at will.
For a ship built within a decade of the Ironclad era starting, and with many ships newer than them already long scrapped, the fact that Lytha and Ma Maros were due to be demobilised in the early 1910s wasn't exactly surprising, although their longevity was. But with the outbreak of World War I, every ship was needed, and once again they were called back into service. The 120mm gun was retained, but everything else was stripped out. With an even newer and larger superstructure installed amidships and aft, and a pair of 70mm cannon installed, one in an aft turret and another atop the new superstructure, with three new machine guns thrown in for good measure. Well, this is about the only place on the ship that doesn't feel like you're cramped into a tiny metal box. Uh, this is the stern deck coming down here. Rather nice view, there's the uh, Hungarian Parliament building. Um, let's see, there you go, nice and open here. Not a lot to see here at the minute, but I'll give you some more information about what used to be back here uh, later on. This is where the uh, that uh, secondary gun was put later on in its career. You can just see the mounting point there. In this conflict, the Leitha would fight again on the Sava River, and then after a several decade gap in visits, it was time to go back over old territory, with the ship taking part in the occupation of Belgrade, or at least the first one, probably accompanied by someone waving a flag saying, did you miss me? During this particular operation, however, the forward turret took a direct hit from enemy shore batteries, so apparently they didn't miss them that much. This killed the gun crew and sent the ship back for repairs. During this period, the ship was given even more firepower in the shape of a 66mm cannon someone had scarfed from somewhere, and she went back to Belgrade, this time with more success, before heading off to support the Central Powers in the defence of the Danube against various attempted crossings. With the conclusion of World War I, the Austro-Hungarian Empire found itself on the losing side, Although the ship dodged initial demobilization and was inducted into the Hungarian Soviet Republic's fleet and sent to fight Czech troops who were trying to intervene. But soon thereafter, Leitha and Maros turned on the communist government in a short lived rebellion. By the time all the chaos had died down, the Entente powers had asserted some semblance of control over the situation and forced the ship to be decommissioned stripping it down to a hulk and selling it at auction, whereupon it became a ballast elevator for riverside commerce. In this guise, she would see out both the interwar period, World War II, and the Cold War, before being recovered in the early 1990s and declared as a historical artefact. In the 2000s, funding was made available, and the ship was restored to its 1880s configuration over the course of about five years, finally opening in the 2010s to visitors, and it can be found moored exactly where I found it a few weeks ago. And so here we are back on the foredeck, back where we started, and uh, so this is going to wrap up this video, this tour of the ship. So with that I'll say thank you very much for watching, hope you enjoyed this little what I did on my holidays by Drac, age XXX.X, and I will give the bell one last ring uh, to say farewell. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.